Let's just give Jesus a yes. moment. We're going to talk about a blind man this morning. Partly so, two blind men. As a matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, and I pray that you do, please turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 43. Verses 31 through 43. Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 43. I don't know if many of you know the story behind a famous Alabamian, if I don't mind to say so, by the name of Helen Keller, who was born blind, deaf, and mute. You got, that's just like what was mentioned in the Bible in Matthew 12. Someone blunt, bluntly asked Helen Keller one time this question. She said, of course, through science, said, Isn't it terrible to be blind? To which she responded, Better to be blind and see with your heart than to have two good eyes and see nothing. Very profound statement. And she was a Christian lady nonetheless as well who overcame much in her life. If she can overcome that, what can me and you overcome? Who have ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to receive. Amen? Amen. You have that passage in Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 43. Would you let that be known by saying amen? amen? The Bible says in Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 43, Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him. And the third day, he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. Verse 35, Then it happened, as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat at the road begging and hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then they, those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he, he had come near, he, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we praise you here today. And Father, we thank you for the wondrous singing we've heard this morning. We thank you for the songs that were sung by Joan and, and the choir. God, we just give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. We're here to exalt you and lift you up. And Father, I pray again that the Holy Spirit of God would fall upon this place as I sense your presence evermore right now. God, have your will, have your way. May this sermon go forth and may your word go forth, God, and accomplish everything that you have set it out to do. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Thank you for this time. We are so privileged to be here. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. We ask these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we recap where we were last week on our snow schedule, and everybody really commented on how great that time was, and that lets me know who sleeps late. And, uh, but we had a good time with the Lord. We learned a lot about a certain young man who came to Jesus asking the best and the most profound question that anyone could ever ask the Savior. 
What must I do to be saved? Or what must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus said, well, He said, you, you, you know this stuff, or you know these things. He said, good teacher. Approach Jesus in that way, which Jesus quickly replied, replied to him to let him know in his thoughts that, hey, listen, only God is truly good. And he said, well, you have to keep the commandments. And he reeled off five of the commandments. So uh, he said this. He said, he said, assuredly, he said, he said, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And I don't know why Jesus chose those. Those are the commandments that deal with our relationship with other people. The first four of the Ten Commandments deal with our relationship vertically with our relationship with God. The last six deal with how we deal with one another. And that's the ones Jesus kept, just reeled off and said to him. My thought on that is simply this. I think those are the ones that that man broke that day. That we all stand guilty before the law of God. This is what the Bible says. And I, I, we talked about the Ten Commandments last week a little bit. We all learned that everybody has lied. Everybody's taken God's name in vain. Everybody has dishonored their mother and father at some point or another. And this is why it got real quiet when we started asking those and asking those probing questions. And I showed you this is the proper and the most biblical way that you can witness to someone. Because here's what the law of God is supposed to do. The law of God is basically in its basic form the Ten Commandments, right? Say amen. Let's amen. Here's what it's designed to do. It is not designed for you and I to keep because you and I cannot keep it. That's why Jesus had to come and save us. That's why Jesus died on the cross. That's why Jesus rose up from the grave. Because we cannot accomplish it on our own. We cannot be good enough. We learn we cannot be wealthy enough. We can't be religious enough. We can't be uh, good enough, as we like to say a lot of times. But when we are confronted with the law of God this way. This is what Paul elaborated on. We talked about this a little bit Wednesday night. And we'll, again, this Wednesday night a little more. But in Romans 3, 19 through 20, the Bible says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. In other words, you can't be good enough and keep the law of God. That's exactly what Jesus told the rich young ruler when He finally said, I kept these from my, from my birth, which is a lie. He lied right there. And Jesus said, well, you still lack one thing. He said, go and sell all that you have and distribute what you make from that to the poor and then you'll be ready. And then you come and follow Me. And the man what? Went away sad because he was very wealthy. Now, let's, let's talk about that just for a moment. Just because he is wealthy, Jesus said it's, after that he turned to the disciples and began to teach this. He said, he said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a wealthy person to get into the kingdom of God. What that means is this. Does that mean that no person that has wealth upon this earth won't make it into the kingdom of God? No, that's not what that means. What it means is those who put their trust in their wealth and their possessions will not enter in the kingdom of God simply because they do not trust in God. That's what he's trying to teach. And understand this, the same way goes for a poor person. If you are poor, and may I say this, if you're an American, you're not poor as compared to the rest of the world. You may have maybe a little bit less poor than some other Americans as far as money goes, but we have more in this country than 80% of all of the world has. And we need to think about that sometimes to be thankful to the Lord. Amen? Amen? But we look back and we see this. Hey, listen, a poor person can't enter either if they don't trust in Jesus. A middle-of-the-road person won't enter in either if they don't trust in Jesus. In other words, what Jesus was saying, this is what He went on to say, as Peter questioned Him, He said, who then can be saved? Because see, in that culture, in that day and time, Wealth was considered a blessing of God. God had blessed that man in some way, form, or fashion the way they would look at that man. Now, yes, true, all good things come from God above. But the way they looked at it, said, well, he got a special blessing of God because look how wealthy he is. And that's some, that's some of the thought we have today, too, as well. And that may, that may be partly true, but does not mean that what Jesus was trying to say. And as Simon Peter asked him, he said, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. In other words, your salvation and my salvation is a miracle of God. 
And at any time that someone gives their heart and their life to Jesus Christ, it is a supernatural act and a supernatural power of God who turns one sinner from being in the darkness and bringing them into the light. That is a miracle, and I don't care whose life it occurs in. And it's of God, it is not of man. Job said, I know you can do everything. And no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Speaking of God, Job 42, 2. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens, the earth, and by your great power and stretched out your arm, there is nothing too hard for you. And then Matthew said it this way, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And always remember this, if you listen, say amen. amen. We learned this in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Take heed. That means pay attention. And beware. That means be warned of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the thing that he possesses. Unless you possess Jesus and He possesses you. That's what is all that will ever matter in this life. Take heed. Pay attention. But it goes on to say this and and, and we, we look, we understand that it's a supernatural work of God for people to be saved. Assuredly, Jesus said in verse 29, He said, I said to them, then Peter said, who can be saved? He said, because we have left all. He said, listen, you told that rich young ruler to sell all he had and go. He said, but listen, we've left all. We've left everything. He said, we've left it all. And you, and we followed you, Jesus. Now, he had a legitimate point. But look what Jesus said. And look at the promise of God here. Assuredly, I say, to you, there is no one who has left house, parents, or brothers, or wife, or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come. That means right now, and in the age to come, in eternal life. He's not saying go leave your home, leave your family, but yet these guys did. They dropped the nets when they were fishing and they followed Christ. Matthew walked right out of the tax booth, left his pen, his, 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 his ledger book, and on he went. Now, is Jesus calling you and I to radical discipleship like that? He may be in some sense of the word. But here's what you have to understand. Don't you worry. Unless you step out of the boat in faith and follow Christ, here's what Christ is looking for. Are you listening to say amen? amen. What Christ is saying, don't worry and don't, be, and don't be afraid to sacrifice the things of the world and your job and your heart. And your life. If God is calling you to the mission field, you go. If He's calling you to preach, you preach. If He's calling you to serve, you serve in some capacity or another. But you will never be let down by sacrificing yourself, your time, your work, everything for God's sake. He will never let you down. Don't be discouraged, church. I'm talking to you now. And you listen to say amen. amen. Do not be discouraged. But here's what God looks for. Someone who is completely submissive. Someone who is completely obedient. And someone who is completely committed to Him. Now honestly, we need to look at ourselves today, don't we? Or do we not? Yes. We're, still on, we're only on the second month of the year. And we have to examine ourselves. Are we completely submissive? Are we completely obedient? And are we completely committed to serving God in God's house for God's glory and not our own? We have to ask ourselves that question because that's what Jesus, that's the kind of sacrifice that Jesus is searching for in His people who He has saved by His grace. And here's what we have to face a lot of times. A lot of times, here's what happens. Now, are you listening? You've got to listen close because I'm talking to you. So if you listen, say amen. amen. Sometimes people, I think, in church, they come and they realize just what a commitment it is to follow Christ. They come in church, they get it, they get it, they get saved, they get baptized, they, give, they, they make a commitment in that way. But when they realize that it is an eternal commitment, a long life commitment, a lot of times you see people back away. Sometimes members come in and, and they're, they're full bore and they want to get involved and they get discouraged by other members who may have been there a little bit longer than them. And they back away, well I tried to serve Brother Slave, but somebody hurt my feelings. Somebody got frustrated. Somebody got discouraged. Listen, I resigned every Monday morning. Every Monday morning I said, I'm done. I'm through. But by Monday afternoon, I come to prayer meeting and it's all done. I get frustrated. I get disappointed. 
I get my feelings hurt, but you know what? I'm a big boy. I can handle it. You know what? Some of you need to put on your big boy pants. Some of you need to put on put on your big girl pants and move on. Don't get mad and say, I ain't going back to that church. Yeah. Hey, I've had my feelings hurt. People talk about me like a dog. It's so easy, and I'm such an easy target. Blame the preacher. I don't care. All I'm worried about is what Jesus thinks. Amen. I'm used to it now. I mean, I get numb to it after five years of doing it and listening and going to you resign every Monday morning. You just get used to it. I said, so you know, so and so said this about you. I said, praise God, I'll pray for them. Praise God, I love them. Give me something to pray about. I don't care. <laughs> I love you, but I don't care. What matters is is what Christ says, right? What matters is is what Jesus says to do. And don't let people, don't let cold water committees discourage you. Go in the bathroom, we'll put some warm water on you, and brush it off, and go on. Don't worry about it because they will come try to discourage you. People do it unknowingly too. I'm not saying they do it on purpose, but yet they'll do it unknowingly. Don't worry about it. Move on. If God has called you to do something, you better do it. And you'll never be let down. He says, I'll give you. He says, he says listen, anybody who has sacrificed for my sake is basically what he's saying. For the advancement of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time. He's talking about right now too, but yet even more in the time to come we spend eternity with Him in heaven. And we'll lay those rewards right at His feet. But He goes on and He says, and listen, one more verse on that. Keep pressing on, because listen, Acts 14.22 says, through many tribulations, Many tribulations, not a few, because some people buy into this. They say, well, if you give your life to Jesus, everything's going to be perfect. You'll never have any problems anymore. And people preach that way. That's a lie. Because the Bible says through many tribulations must we go through to enter into the kingdom of God. Many tribulations. We're not divorced from it. And yes, we're all going to get our feelings hurt, right? We're all going to be discouraged. We're all going to be frustrated. Get over it. Move ahead. Go on. Go on. Get more Jesus on you and go on. You can't wallow in that kind of mindset. But we'll never get anything accomplished. We'll never see this community change for Christ. We'll never, if we take that type of attitude, because remember, it's not about them and it's not about you. It's all about Jesus. And it's about serving Him. And we all make mistakes. Man, I have made plenty Plenty of mistakes, and I'll make many more. You know what? But you know what? You learn. There's a learning curve. You learn, and you move past those things. And if something doesn't work, then try something else. We're going to move Monday night prayer, maybe Thursday night for a while. If it doesn't work, we'll move it back. But we're going to keep on praying. We're going to keep on serving. We're going to do what we need to do. Be consistent in your walk with God. Lack of consistency is what causes everyone to fail in ministry. Not to say you won't fail at other times, but if you don't, if you're not consistent in what you do, then you will fail. But be consistent in your walk with God. That's what he asked for. Persistence and consistency in your walk. Well, then he took the twelve aside and he said this to them. And they didn't listen. He said. Very plainly, if you can't see the gospel in verses 31 through 33, you're not listening either. And you're not reading. But look what he says. He says, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The reason why they say going up, remember, Jerusalem from every point in Palestine was up a hill. It was a descent. You are physically going up to Jerusalem because it was built on, a, on, a, on an elevation of part of the land. And he says, But we are going up to Jerusalem and all things, not some things, not part of the things, but all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. Not might be, not they, well, I don't know will be, but will be accomplished. Everything that was said of Jesus about His death, burial, and resurrection was already foretold in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and many other places. It was foretold, and it, he said, by the prophets. What did He say at the end of this, of this book in Luke 24? He said, did you not understand it from the writings and from the law 
and from the prophets that all things concerning myself would come true. That the Bible, the Old Testament said that I am the Messiah, I am God, I am the Savior of the world. It's basically what he says in Luke 24. But he goes on and he says, All things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered into the, to the Gentiles, will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. And that's pretty, pretty big talk. And see what they didn't understand what it says, but they understood none of these things. None of these things, because you know why? In their culture, in the way they were taught, was this: the Messiah would be the second coming of David. And spiritually speaking, that was true. But it's one greater than David. This was one whose kingdom would have no end. David's kingdom lasted 40 years. Solomon, his son's kingdom, lasted 40 years. But to this one in Samuel 7, 2 Samuel 7, verse 12, says there will be no end to his kingdom. And they prophesied this concerning himself. And they would deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Why would they do that? Because you see, the Jews would not execute someone of their own race. And so they deceived them. They taught, they told lies that Jesus himself was a blasphemer. And they handed him over into the Gentiles, into the hands of the Romans. And what happened to him? He was mocked. He was made fun of. A crown of thorns was placed upon his head and driven into his head by a reed. And that reed was handed to him as a scepter. They put a purple robe on him, stripped him buck naked, and humiliated him, called him names, and beat his eyes so they couldn't even swallow his shut. And then they cover his head and hit him again and say, Prophesy about that, Messiah. Prophesy about that. Pulled his beard out, spit in his face. And then they scourged him, which was the way of execution before a man was hung on a cross. And I mean scourged him, they scourged him, folks. And what that means, they took a cat of nine tails and they beat him until every shred of muscle and every shred of skin was torn off of his back, all over his legs, all over his body. And Jesus himself was a bloody mess of the God-man. And they took him and put that heavy crossbar across his back and through the streets of Jerusalem he went where he was mocked, scorned, made fun of again, <laughs> spit upon all the way for about a mile and a half till he went to his execution upon that cross. And when he got there, this is what they did. And execution by crucifixion is one of them. As a matter of fact, that's where we get the word excruciating from. That's the most excruciating form of execution ever thought of by a mortal man. Because you would die a slow and agonizing death. Most people didn't make it through the scourging. But Jesus did because he had to. And when he finally got to Mount Calvary, they took nine inch nails and they drove them through his through his old bone, right here, his old nerve, right here, the median nerve, and pain shot through all out of his body. Both of them, nine inch nails. And through his ankle bones, two nine inch spikes, driven into a hard wooden old board. And can you imagine again that that, that old that median nerve is crushed? That sends pain pulsating throughout your body like when you hit your funny bone but about a thousand times worse. You imagine that pain of numbness going all through your body and coursing through your body. And what crucifixion does, are you listening to say amen? amen? What it does is this. It causes you to basically hang there and suffocate. And there he is pushing up with every little brass breath he had. Both arms pulled out of socket and trying to push his head. His hip pulled out of socket. Push it up with out of socket joints to pull himself up. And the whole time, you know what he's doing? He is quoting Psalm 22. He's quoting Scripture. And he is forgiving those who have come against him and hung. He said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And he hung there and he gasped for his last breath. And finally, in the seventh saints of the cross was finished, and he hung there and he stood and he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. Our salvation was accomplished. The devil was defeated. Really, when he came up from the grave, three days later, he gave us victory over, over our sins, over ourselves, over the wrath of God because he absorbed the wrath of God for us. He accomplished our salvation for us because you know why? We cannot save ourselves. As we learn from the rich young rulers, who said, I've got this, I've got that, and I've done this. It's not about what you do. It's about what you receive. Are you willing to receive what Christ died for you for? Because He's absorbed the wrath of God upon Himself. He was laid in the tomb up from the grave He arose to give you victory over yourself, over hell, over the wrath of God, and over our sins. 
That's what he died for. For me and you who are willing to receive him humbly as he teaches in the same scripture, like a child, complete childlike dependence upon Christ for your salvation. No other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, through the bloody cross and the empty tomb. Well, they scourged him, they killed him, and on the third day he will rise again. He prophesied this, and they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know these things which were spoken. Why is that? Because their view of a Messiah was skewed. Their view of a Messiah, they thought that David would come again, Elijah would precede him, and that he would come again and he would wipe the earth clean of Greco-Roman rule. There were Greeks that lived throughout, throughout Galilee. There were Romans that ruled the land. And they thought, hey, he, our Messiah is going to wipe the earth of everyone who is not Jewish. And you know what? They still believe that to this day. And if you're not Jewish, they consider you unclean and a Gentile. And a person who's a Gentile is somebody simply not Jewish. But see, Jesus had a bigger plan and a bigger picture than that. He told Abraham, he said, your, your descendants will be as many as the sands upon the seas. He said, your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky. I promise you this, Abraham. And Abraham, he preached the gospel. Paul said, he preached the gospel to Abraham way back when. And Abraham did this. He believed by faith in what God told him. He preached the gospel, what Galatians says to him. And he did it thoroughly through his own son. Did he not? Through Isaac? He preached it through that. God would be the sacrifice. His own son would be the sacrifice. His only one and only unique son, His only begotten son would be the perfect and sinless sacrifice for me and for you. And they didn't understand that because they thought in a different way. And they didn't understand it until Jesus says at the end of this, this book in Matthew 24, He opened their eyes when He read to them and expounded to them upon the Scriptures. And their eyes were what? Open. Then they understood it what Jesus was saying. Well, we understand this, and the Son of Man, that phrase, the Son of Man, comes out of Daniel, being prophesied by the prophets, as Jesus said in that Scripture. Daniel said this in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man. That was Jesus' famous favorite name for Himself, was the Son of Man. This is where He draws us from. Coming in the clouds of heaven, He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into His presence. And just like Matthew 28 says, He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power over all peoples, nations, and men of every language that worshiped Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's what Daniel prophesied about Jesus. That's the truth in Scripture about what He was going to do. Now listen to what we're going to talk about now. We're going to talk about a blind man named Bartimaeus. Mark's Gospel names him. He named him for a purpose so we would know who he was. A blind man named Bartimaeus. Three things I want you to see about Bartimaeus. Number one, Bar 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 Bartimaeus was, had blind sight. Number two, he had, well, hear the blind man's plea. Number three, Jesus' response to that blind man. You've got to think real quick. Are you thinking? Are you awake now? Anybody sleeping here today? Let me just check in here. All right. Number one, look here at the blind sight. Blind sight. Does that make any sense? Blind sight. That's an oxymoron, is it not? Blind sight. Verse 35. Did it happen? Not if it happened, not did it happen, but it happened. As he was coming near Jericho, Jesus now is facing his, his life and his mind and his flint. His like, face like flint headed toward Jerusalem to accomplish what he said in those last four, four, four verses. He knew where he was going. He knew where he was going. But then... On the way to Jericho, the city of Rose is a beautiful place out in the middle of the desert. All of a sudden it just gets lush, green, and beautiful. There's Jericho out in the middle of the desert. But then it, it pops up into this beautiful place. And he was coming near Jericho. Then a certain blind man sat by the road begging. Now, understand this. Handicapped people in those days, again, handicapped people were outcast of society. There was no, no, no preference for them. There were, unless you had family members to take care of them, they were outcast and they were forced to beg just like a widow or an orphan was in those days. They were cast out. Nobody wanted anything to do with them. Because here's how they would look at that. Because he was born blind, here's what they would say. Well, your mother and daddy must have been big time sinners because that's why you were born blind. Do we not use that same mindset today sometimes? If we think about what we say sometimes, we think the same way. Do we not? We all listen and say amen. We do. We say, boy, he must not be living right. Boy, the Lord's just pounding him. Lord will pound you if you are living right. You don't believe that? Ask Job. 
Ask Job about what he thought about that. Sometimes God will allow you to go through hard times to make you more like Him. To show you your childlike dependence should be utterly and completely upon Him. And then you're able to minister to others better. He can use that. So he, what He can't use is arrogance and pride like the rich young ruler had. But here's one that had total humility, childlike dependence. Here comes a blind man out of nowhere, set by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. Can you imagine this now? Think about this. Think about being blind. Can you, can you just imagine with me just for a moment? Blind from birth, you have no idea that the sky is blue because you don't know what blue is. You have no idea that people's shirts can be red because you have no idea what red is. You, all you've ever seen from the time you left your mother's womb is dark black. You have no idea that the ocean sometimes can have a blue and green tint to it. You have no idea that the clouds can look like pillows and be pillowed with, pillow with white. We have no idea of this whatsoever. You imagine being born that way. Without being able to see, without being able to understand how somebody leads you around, but yet your other senses become higher. You're able to hear better. You're able to feel better with touch. And it's amazing how that is and how the other senses in your body increase. But yet you don't know what the color green is. You don't know the grass is green. You don't know how white a cotton field looks when it's in full bloom. You don't understand how beautiful a cornfield can look. And on that, or a river, a lake, whatever, a snowy mountain or a snowy ground. You don't know how beautiful the snow looks when it's falling. Only when it's falling. <laughs> one of those things. But you have no idea of what white means. You don't know. You don't understand what black is. Because I, well, you may understand that because it's all you can see. But you think about that. You project yourself there. And somebody had to lead you around as you fill around your way all of your life. And this man's forced to beg you by the road. But yet, I think somewhere along the line, someone taught this man the Old Testament. He knew the Scriptures some way, somehow. He knew the Old Testament because he he wanted to know what all the ruckus was. He could hear the ruckus. And remember this. When Jesus would go anywhere, throngs of people followed Him everywhere. So you're talking about thousands and thousands of people thronging around the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords coming into a town. And, and little boys running ahead of Him saying, Jesus is coming. Jesus the Nazarene is coming. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Hosanna. Some of them would probably holler that and other people would probably say, Hush, don't say that. You would hear a mixture of that, I guarantee it. But yet, this man knew enough. He knew enough to hear this, that multitude. And somebody maybe told him, you know what, Jesus can heal blind people. Jesus can heal the lame. Jesus can heal the deaf. Jesus can, can raise the dead. He's done these things. Even before now, he has done those things. And this man may have caught a, caught a word of that. And so, he's not worried anymore about his stick to feel around. He hears that multitude and he up he comes. And so they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. May I say something to you here today? Let me say something to you here today. If you're lost, you are blind as Bartimaeus was right now. You might as well shut your eyes right now. Because you're blind. And you know what? Bartimaeus knew this simple truth. The only chance he had in this life and in the life after was that Jesus of Nazareth was about to pass him by. And he wasn't going to allow that chance to happen. You know what he was going to do? He was going to fight his way through that crowd and he was going to yell and cry out to Jesus for mercy to not only heal this sight, but to heal the heart, the sight of his eyes. He was going to come out across there and say, Oh, Jesus! Oh, Jesus! Oh, Son of David! Have mercy on me! That's what he did. Look what he says. And hearing the multitude passing, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. A blind man, a blind sight, but now we see the blind man's plea. He began to plead and to cry out. He says, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. The way that's phrased in the original language, he kept doing it, and he kept doing it with an echoing voice of louder and louder, crying out to Jesus, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And look what happens. Those who went before him warned him that he should be quiet. They told him to hush. They told him to quit calling out on Jesus now. And quit. And you know why? Because Jesus, son of David, is a messianic, what a geographical name. It was a theologically correct name for who was passing by. It was God in flesh. It was the Savior of the world. And people were saying, be quiet. Because one, they feared. 
the religious leaders of that day would get them for saying that. They feared and they, they didn't want some people to hang. Listen, it, it's been very obvious to me. You know, some people just don't like preachers. You know what? I mean, I mean that's, been very, that's been made very obvious to me in my life. And I'm not talking about before. I'm talking about right now. And, it, and it, you know why they don't like preachers? Number one is an authority issue there. There's also a submissive issue. If somebody's not really to submit to the authority of a pastor, they're certainly not going to submit to the authority of Jesus. Ouch. True, though. you got a, you got an authority problem if you don't like preachers. Now, I didn't dislike preachers back when I was lost, but I didn't want to be around them. And when somebody goes to hollering out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, it'll offend somebody, doesn't it? Does it offend you here this morning? I don't know. Does it really offend you? But see, this man was lost in his heart, but he also couldn't see anything. He couldn't see nothing. And he knew the only chance that he had was to cry out to Jesus for salvation, for divine help. He said, have mercy on me. And may I say to you here today, the only chance that any of you have in this life and the life to come is if you are willing to humble yourself and be childlike dependent and cry out to Jesus for help. And don't you worry about what anybody else says. They tell you to be quiet, you keep on doing it. And that's what he did. He says, he says, be quiet. But he cried out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now look at Jesus' response. So Jesus stood still. Now you think about this. Thousands of people are thronging around Jesus. And this is a picture into the heart and the mercy of our Lord and Savior. Thousands of fun people. He's moved through town. He's headed to Jer Jericho. And, he, and, he, and he's, he, he's going he, you know, 17 miles from Jerusalem, basically. And he's going through there. And all of a sudden, boom, he just stops. <clears throat> because he hears the cry and the plea of a man who was in need of mercy. And if you're in need of mercy right now, I don't know, you may be saved. You know, I don't know that if you're not, in whatever you're going through right now, if you are in need of mercy here today, cry out to Jesus Christ because He will give you mercy. Look at the heart and compassion of our Savior. A man who was an outcast in his own society, that's exactly who Jesus pinpointed. Out of all of those people was a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. And he stopped right when he was doing. He said, hey, hold up. He said, bring that man to me. That just shows you it's a divine act of God. When you and I get saved, or anybody else gets saved, Jesus will do this. He will call you out of the darkness and into the light. And that's exactly what He did, Bartimaeus. That's exactly what He did with Bill Lazarus. And that's exactly what He's done with you and me if we've been born again. He has called and commanded you to come out of the darkness, to come out of the light. He's heard your call and He's heard your plea. Look what He says. He said, He said, Pat, He said, Bring him to me. And he brought him to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? Do you think Jesus didn't know what that man needed? You don't think Jesus knew that man before he ever was put in his mother's womb? Yes, he did. But you know why he did this? So why did he want him blind then? So that God may be glorified through the power of God and His miracle working power and to show the world that the Messiah had come to the world to save the world. Even the most outcast person of society. Look what he said. He says, what do you want me to do? And he said, Lord, that I may have my sight. And Jesus said very simply, receive your sight and your faith has made you well. Now understand this. There are many of you right here right now. You are lost. You are without God. You don't know God. And here's why. Some of you don't want to know God. Some of you don't care anything about God. Some of you don't care about your sin. And you, and you see what happens to people? They, when the more a person sins, are you listening to say amen? amen? The more a person sins, the more blind to sin they become. But one day, somehow, some way, through the power of the preaching of the Word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, what God does through His Holy Spirit is awaken your heart. And awaken my heart, just like He did Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was awakened in his heart. He knew the only hope that he had was to cry out to Jesus for salvation. Friend, that's the only hope you have in this life and in the life to come. He said, your faith has made you. And you know what happened? He believed. He didn't believe just believing that, that a man from Nazarene was coming by. He believed that Jesus was the Son of God. He believed that He was the Messiah. He believed that He was the Savior of the world. And what Bartimaeus did was he poured all of his faith, all of his trust, all of everything. 
everything he had and he completely adhered and laid it on the line and said, here I am, Jesus. Save my soul and give me sight. And Jesus said, he, made, he said, your faith has made you well. And that means he was made complete from the inside out. Physically and spiritually. Because look what happened. Verse 43. And this is what will happen. Because you know what? Blind Bartimaeus was blind. But now he can see. He says that immediately he received his sight and followed him. He laid down everything he had, which was nothing, but yet he followed him and glorified God. And all the people then saw it and they gave praise to God. That's what happens. And that should be the response when we see Jesus move in such a supernatural way, which is the only way he can move. And work and move in the lives of all of our lives, but especially in the lives of this man. He got saved. He got made whole. And he, can you just imagine not knowing what anything was as far as color in his life and things like that? No depth perception or anything. And the first thing he opened his eyes to was Jesus Christ. And may I say this? If you know Jesus, you listening? If you know Jesus, when you die, and you will die. No matter, we're all going to die. You understand that, don't you? When we die, those of us who know Christ, when we leave this body and leave this old body behind, if we know Christ, the first thing we'll see is Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present from the, with the Lord. And when you die, you'll be present with the Lord. That's why you should, if you know Christ, you shouldn't walk around acting like you have no hope. Worried about what Obama's doing. Worried about what the judge is doing. And again, who cares? You think that's going to matter a hundred years from now? What matters is if you know Jesus. Because you won't wake up and say, Obama, I guarantee you that. I could not, I'll stand on my flat feet and tell you for sure. You won't see that. But you will see Jesus or you won't. Which one is it today for you? Do you need mercy from the Savior here today? And if you do, cry out to Jesus for salvation. Cry out to Him for healing. Cry out to Him for your needs to be met. Because He'll meet His, His, His riches and glory is enough. His grace is enough. And it will hold you, sustain you, and keep you for all of eternity. What are you working on? What are you waiting on? Let Jesus open up the eyes of your heart. As the song says, open up the eyes of my heart, O oh Lord. Open up the eyes of my heart. Let Him open your eyes here this morning. We ask and pray this, and we're going to pray right now. In the attitude of prayer, let's pray. Let's close it out with prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I love You, and I thank You so much, Father, for You being all-powerful. That blind Bartimaeus, like many of us who are saved, has to come to the Lord as the Lord instructed these disciples that day. As a little child, humbly and completely dependent upon Jesus Christ and nothing else. Father, let us not be like the rich young ruler and walk away sad. Because we're too wor we worship the things of this world and not Jesus. Let us come like blind Bartimaeus. Completely and dependent upon Christ to save our souls. Because Lord, we know from Scripture that there is no other way that any man, woman, or young person can be saved except through the blood of Jesus. Father, I pray You will save souls here today moving in the way only that You can do. Lord, we praise You. We love You. We thank You for Your supernatural power to work and to move and to save anyone from the guttermost to the uttermost. Lord, You are all powerful. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. There is nothing impossible for You. Father, we ask and pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. You would please stand in an attitude of prayer right where you are.